we welcome Luis Torres to the show. Luis, how are you today? Good. Uh, thank you for having me, man. Uh, we, we normally start with a uh, little question about how your weekend was, but uh, it was kind of a somber weekend for everyone. Um, I'm from the El Paso region. I grew up there. So I just wanted to send out my thoughts and prayers for the people from, from El Paso. Yes, yes. And also from Dayton and recently from Gilroy as well. I don't, I don't really know what to say other than we are, we're so sorry for everyone's losses in the last several days. Um, life is tough sometimes, but, um, I guess it's a little difficult to move on from that, but, uh, we, uh, we would like to know about you. So if you don't mind telling us what your favorite superpower is, we would love to hear it. I would say uh, uh, reading minds. I yeah. would think that would be really interesting, and uh, to know what people are thinking mm -hmm. when you look when you see somebody. What are they? What do they want? What are they thinking? What What are their feelings? Their thoughts behind? You know, if they're actually saying what they're meaning, right? Right. Uh, I think that would be a really cool uh, superpower to, to to have. Right. So when you, when you say what they're saying, if they're saying what they're meaning, would you hear it as like another voice while they're talking or how would you want to interface with reading minds? I think it would be cool to have, uh, uh hear the other voice of the other people, their uh -huh. internal voice, you have, 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 have an opportunity to hear their, their inner voice of what they're saying, you know, okay. You know, uh, uh, is he right? Maybe he's not wrong, you know, uh, especially, you know, it's an economist who, who you normally deal with a lot of people. You do you do talks. You you, you teach also, and it would be interesting to see what what they're thinking when you're saying something. You know, you're you're, you're trying to explain. You know, this is happening. What this is what we see in the economy, right. and actually listen to them saying, okay, okay, I don't I don't believe you because of this. This is oh. maybe they won't say it to you uh, in, a, in a public forum, right. but maybe that way they're safe. But you can actually okay, and then you can answer them back. No. But this is true because of this. This is this is the evidence right. behind what I'm saying. Right. right. I'm not just talking and just saying it because I'm just yeah. Saying sure, it, right? sure. Here are the things that we know, and then sometimes here are the things that we don't know. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Give us sixty seconds on your road to Texas a So it's an interesting road. You know, it's it's. Uh, it, I don't want to. It's going to sound like it was meant to happen, but it, it, it was surely determined in a certain way. Uh, I was working at Central Bank in Mexico. Uh, I was happy there, but I, I had me and my family, myself, we wanted to come back to the U.S. And uh, we were, I was looking also to grow as an economist, take my, take my, prof my, my professional career, doing something more, more interesting things to progress, you know, to advance my career. And then, uh, interestingly, I, I kind of, I talked to my old boss at the Dallas Fed, uh, Bill Gilmer, about my interest of coming back to the U.S. And... You know, it's interesting, you know, the right moment, uh, the, right the right timing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he told me, you know, by the way, I have a really good friend, the director of the Real Estate Center at Mays Business School at, at Texas a m who's actually looking for somebody with your profile. Hmm. Somebody who's an applied economist uh, with experience in looking at the economy, uh, analyzing the economy. And, uh, you know, he... It was interesting. He, he gave me his, he gave uh, Gary Mailer his information, the chief economist information. Just Gary called. They called me back. They emailed me. They called me all the way from College Station to Mexico City. I was living in Mexico City. Uh, I did a, a, a telephone interview. I believe it went really well. They follow up with with a fly through to from Mexico. They flew me from Mexico City to, to College Station, and it was great. They interviewed me here. They they I had an opportunity to talk to the to the, all the staff. And then, you know, after that, they, they made me an offer. And after, after that, six, seven years after that, I'm, I'm here and I'm really happy here at the, at the real estate center. That's great. That's great. It's a, it's always nice when it feels like something was maybe not intended to happen, but where it was such a happy coincidence, perhaps, yeah. or, or maybe there was something else at it's, work. Exactly. Right. Because it's, it's funny because sometimes you, you, I don't know it happens in a lot of people's lives it's happened to me before when you're like, Oh, I want to do this, or or you 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 kind of force things to happen, and it mm -hmm. don't happen, and you're frustrated, right? And you're like, oh my god, this is not happening. Why? And then suddenly, booms, things happen, and it's so and they're smooth, right? 
going, going back to Garth Brooks' song, remember that? Uh, oh, yeah. Sometimes God's but his, uh, greatest gifts are Our unanswered, unanswered prayers. prayers right? yeah. You yeah. never think, of, when I heard that song, that lyric, I'm like, oh my God, that, I, he's right. You know, something's happened for a reason don't ha- or don't happen for a reason. And some, because something's better out there for you. Something's out there for you, right? Yeah. Yeah, I often think about that song in terms of relationships. I, <laughs> of course, right? <laughs> very, well, which is what the song is about. Exactly. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I've been very blessed in that regard. Love my wife. Um, but yeah, but a lot of good things happen in regard to uh, business as well. Uh, so as we often do, we're going to steal a few introductory questions from a previous guest, Mike Alexander. Where did you grow up? Uh, I was I was born in California, but when I was eight years old, we moved to El Paso Juarez. So I grew up in the borders. So that was that was interesting. You know, uh, people don't understand the dynamics in the borders. Sometimes they think about it. You know, it's you know it's like any region or city. They're really interconnected between each other. Right. It's like College Station and Bryant, right? Sure. The only difference there, there's a bridge, right? You have mm-hmm. to cross, or and that's it. But basically. People that live in El Paso, the people who live in Juarez, go back and forth every day. Some people work in Juarez, some people work in El Paso. So it's it's a really it's it's really common for you to go back and forth and 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 a really knit community, really close community between each other. So so it's 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 an interesting dynamic, right? Because you you think of people think I'm going to another country, right? Oh my God, I'm going. To, oh, you're excited, right? Here you just cross. Presently, in this case, the bridge, right? And you're you're in another country, you know. And it was it was really cool because it, 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 I grew up in the '80s there, so still, you know, it was before September 11th. I think after that was a major change that changed everything, and, and right, rightly rightly so, right? Uh, before that, you know, you would cross, you know, you wouldn't show it. You basically wouldn't show any papers. Like in my case, you would sit. I would cross. They would ask you the border patrol. Are you you were a citizen? Yes, you were a citizen, and they would. Let you pass. Like, hmm. you would, I would, you would bring your birth certificate if you need it. Yeah, you could have your passport, but it wasn't not, it wasn't that necessary. Yeah. You know, and it was just crossing was more easy. You know, it wasn't so, but now, of course, things change, you know, and, True. and now you have to show your passport through longer lines. Other things have happened. The world has changed. Even in Mexico, things have changed. In the U.S. have changed. Right. How many in your family growing up? So that, it was, uh, I have a younger brother and a younger sister. Uh, they're really uh, awesome. They're really different from me. You know, I follow them more like an econ uh, uh, profession. Uh, just seeing my sister's an architect. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my brother is uh, poli sci. Okay. So, and it's interesting because nobody in the family does poli sci. So that was that was interesting for us that he would decide to do that. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're great people, uh, smart, so yeah, hardworking. Yeah, yeah. So I had, I, the only thing the only thing is that we have a uh, there's a little difference, an age difference between us. So I was alone for a long time. You know, mm. for my for my sister, I was like I, I was like nine years, ten years older than my sister. Oh, and my okay. brother's my brother is thirteen years old. Oh, interesting. The difference between us. What was your first job? So my first job was actually working at, uh, my aunt was an administrator not in a hospital uh-huh. in the city of Chihuahua, Mexico. So she gave me a summer job for the first time. So it was interesting. I would help people there. I would help like in the administration, you know, look at things, uh, paperwork, uh, we'd go, you know, take things to a certain place. Uh, basically, you know, do er- errands there. So that was a, 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 a cool, uh, a cool experience a job. I always worked. I tried to work during the summers. I like doing things during the summer. I know I did travel, but I also enjoyed uh, uh, working. My real formal cool job is like finance economist was in a brokerage firm. Okay. I worked at BBB, Ban- Banco Bilbao Biscaya, BBBA. Okay. Now, it was interesting, you know, it was my first actual, uh, uh, first actual time that I saw like final finance work, how the stock market worked. And it was an interesting time because it was uh, the late, the mid 90s, late 90s in, in Mexico. And it was when the economy was opening up. Uh, Mexico had a lot of reforms at that time, so they opened up the ca- the capital sector. So a lot of money was coming there. They also re- uh, liberalized their exchange rate. It became a, a free a foreign exchange rate. Mm-hmm. So it was it was as things were happening right, and also it was a time when uh, a lot of public companies 
became privatized, privatized before huh. they were part of the government and now they became privatized. So okay. it was a good, good t- time to be the market because, you know, there was a lot of, uh, well, uh, a ch- it was a lot of change and, and there was a lot of, at that moment, a lot of hope for the Mexican economy because, you know, before it was more, uh, more government, more inefficient. And now, you know, they moved more toward a more private outlook, mm. you know, where, uh, where the, the 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 companies should have a really important role in development before the government played a real a real important role. Right. So they moved that that transition. So there was a lot of you know excitement happening in that moment. So it was a cool place to work that at, at that moment. Right. And now you said and you said the economy was opening up. So some of that probably just means there were more private opportunities, but sure. but is there more that you mean by that when you say the economy was opening up? Yes, there's more by that. Uh, of course, NAFTA happened in 94. Mm-hmm. So you have all these these, these things, you know, uh, private investment, a lot of companies was coming, were coming into the, to Mexico to invest also. Right. So you have a lot of, of interesting dynamics happening in, at, the, at that moment in, in, in Mexico. Uh, hmm. And that, that was, a, I think, that was a, a, a big, uh, important step in the Mexican economy. That transition period after, after the '90s, mid '90s, when the economy suddenly opened up to the world. Basically, before it was a closed economy. You know, right mm-hmm. now, if you, if you go to the, like uh, the '80s, you wouldn't see as many, you know, international products. It was all more, I more see. like nat- Mexican companies, uh, consumer products. Uh, of course, the cars were the three big car companies, right? But after that, the new Japanese, like Honda, huh. more German automotive companies came into the to the Mexican economy. Who were the three big car companies so, before then? Joe Motors, Ford. Oh, I see. Okay, okay, okay. So the big, big three from Detroit were there in Mexico. I see, during I see. All that. It, it, but, and, and, and there also was Nissan. Huh. But besides that... There were not, there wasn't uh, Hondas. Right. There weren't uh, Toyota. Toyotas. Right. All these, uh, Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi, uh, Mercedes Benz, BMW. Huh. So it was all these more, you know, all the big three from Detroit were the major industries because they were considered national, also national Mexican com- national, I gotcha. national industry. Right, and right. And after that, it opened up. Sure. So it, it was interesting, you know, also, you know, before that, uh, Let's say you wanted to buy a computer. He, a lot of people in Mexico came to the U.S. and bought consumer goods. You know, huh. like the new a new television set, a new refrigerator, right? Because you couldn't get it in Mexico huh. because the economy was so close. Huh. But now you can get anything in Mexico because of the openness, because of the trade. Right? The day that a new iPhone comes out here in the U.S., it'll probably take two days before it came out. Uh, another example: movies. It would take like six months, you know, ah. for a new movie to come out <laughs> in Mexico or here in the U.S. where it came out here. Right. But that doesn't happen anymore. Like, uh, there'd be a couple of years where, like, uh, uh, the, the Avenger movies, the mm-hmm. Marvel Avenger movies, actually, a couple, of, a couple of them came out first in Mexico than here in the U.S. Because, hmm. you know, it was a worldwide uh, screening. Worldwide right? release. Yeah. Release, exactly. So, if you crossed into the U.S. to buy a television set, for yes. example, was that practice frowned upon? It, it, the other thing that changed, another good point, but before that, uh, unfortunately, there was, there was a less, it, it wasn't looked good. Like it was frowned apart. And uh, there wasn't a clear way to do it. So there was a lot of, you know, unfortunately, a lot of corruption involved. I see. It, you would have to. You would cross board. You would cross it back back to Mexico, and the the border patrol agents in Mexico would look at what you have. Mm-hmm. So by looking at what you have, they would be, oh, you know what? You have too many things, or so what is that? So could you? Kill so I think you have to pay a little extra tariff here with me, right? Mm, right. A little bribe. Right. That would happen. And with with the the refrigerators, television sets that you wanted to import. You probably was you had to bribe somebody to get it back because it was it was front apart. Hmm. But that also happened after ninety four. They introduced uh, a, basically a system where you push a button and it's it's determined uh, in a statistical way. Uh, they stated in which in which if you get a red light, they'll check you. Mm-hmm. If you get a green light, you pass. If you don't have to, nothing to declare. And also, what they did if they've now you can do it legally, right? If I want to import a television set, 
although you can find it in Mexico, by the way, it's not like before, but let's say you can't, you can't find it in the U.S. or you got a good bargain in the U.S., you can actually now do the paperwork and import it legally and pay your, imp- your tariffs. Oh, okay. So now it's, it's a, clear, a clear way to do things, you know, establish uh, rules, of, of rules of the game. And before that, 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 that didn't exist. There's a lot of gray area. There, exactly. There was a lot of gray area. That's why you were like, oh, uh, you had to plan in advance. Let's yeah. say you wanted to you know, like import a new television set, refrigerator, or a washing machine, et cetera, et cetera. Right. In advance, you would tell the people, oh, yeah, I want to import this. How much are you going to charge me? Right. right. Okay. And then you would pass it that mm. way. But now it's clear. I think that's the other thing that's happened in Mexico. I think that change. You know, there's more, there are more established rules of law than before. They still have to go further. Mm-hmm. I think the, one of the major issues facing Mexico is the lack of rule of law. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the reasons why me- Mexico hasn't progressed as it should progress because of lack of strong institutions in the country. I see. Where is the clearest place that that shows up? Well, best, you, best example. Uh, be, uh, be, best example of uh, taxes. Okay. So let's say uh, what the revenue from the government is still, there's a big informal sector okay. in Mexico. I see. Well, a lot of people don't pay taxes. Oh. So that's the major issue. If you're not in a, if you have your own uh, business, it's really difficult for them to tap, to find you and, and tax you. Huh. It's, it's getting more difficult to do that. But still, you don't have to show your income levels. When you're an employee, each month, you're going to get taxed. It's clear. It's right. clear They're, because you, the companies have to do that. Right. But when it's not, you don't. So that, that's a major issue. And also, you know, another thing is like strong institutions like corruption. I think it's one of the major issues still facing Mexico, unfortunately, is that they have to more clear institutions, stronger institutions, a, a better judicial system to fight uh, uh, corruption in the country. Hmm. Hmm. What was your greatest challenge as a child? My greatest challenge, I think, was the move from from California to El Paso, Juarez. Because, you know, uh, not because I'm not <laughs> into, you know, but growing up, you're eight years old, mm-hmm. you have the beach, right? The California lifestyle. <laughs> Disneyland is two hours and a half of dri- uh, drive, drive away. Right. So it's, it was really cool growing up there, you know? I, I, I had a, you know, I, we would live in San Diego. We, I had a birthday party at Bubba Park, you know? And then you move it to El Paso Juarez. And when I moved, it was the 80s. El Paso Juarez was still really small. It's not what it is right now. It's, it's grown a lot, especially El Paso and also Juarez. So it was really small. There was not a lot of things to do. So I think that, that and you know, my friends, my life, and moving here to, to Juarez. So I think that, to Juarez and all that, that was like the biggest, biggest uh, one of my biggest challenges, adapting to that. And the other reason is that my, the reason we moved is, uh, was my parents separated. Oh. So that, uh, at the effect, you know, you have sure. that mindset of a pretty cool childhood growing up there. And then you move to, to El Paso Juarez and we moved to live with my grandparents. My grandparents were awesome. My grandparents basically raised me. Uh, but still that, that transition, you, know, you lived in a cool place and then the change, the, the change of family dynamic also. What did your parents, family, your grandfather, what did, the, what did everyone do for a living and how did that impact you? So it didn't impact me in an interesting way because I knew I wanted to do something related to business and finance. My, okay. my father, my father's an economist, but he did, he, he went to, a, he, he followed a pathway of finance, became a banker. Actually, my grandfather was his boss. Oh. He married my, the boss's daughter, basically. I see, I see. My father was a banker. Uh, so my grandfather was also a banker. So that lifestyle really is it's a kid interest to me. When I saw them, I would go, you know, to their offices at the bank and it was really cool. It was the eighties, you know, a different type of banking, you know, it was more personal. They would always, you know, bankers in the past knew everybody in the community, right? Mm-hmm. They would know John from the hardware store or the, or John, who sold, I don't know, the retail or was the owner of the local dealership, outer dealership. They, they, they had this, this network of people and it was based on knowing them. So it was really cool because, you know, they would, he would come to me and tell me stories. We would meet these, all these, these clients. So it was, it, was, it was really cool, you know, and I like what they did. And, and the other thing that, <laughs> that kind of put me in that pathway since I was young. I want to be a, 
a bank. For us, I thought I wanted to be an economist. I want to do finance. I want to be a banker. This is, this sounds really cool. I like what they're doing. They go to the office. They wear suits, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. They come back. This is cool. I, I, I want to be, a, I, one day I want to do this, you know, when I'm older. Yeah. A lot of people talk about not having to wear a suit to the office, but between you and me, I've, I always have liked wearing a suit. I've not always be, felt yeah. comfortable in one. Yeah. I don't know why. Let's get into your career a bit. You spent a little over 15 years at uh, uh, Mexico Central Bank, Banco de Mexico. Correct. Banco de Mexico. Um, what, was the, what was the most counterintuitive insight you picked up as an economist during your time there? So central banks are, you know, great, a great place for economists, especially if you want to be an applied economist. I think there was no better way, uh, better training ground to learn how to be an actual economist mm-hmm. in the real world. And I think one of, a lot of, one of the things I learned that was kind of current, current to your comment was, especially when there's a shock, a, temp, a temporary shock, you might think, you know, prices are going up. You should basically maybe increase the Fed, the 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 the, the central bank's rate, mm. right? In the case of the U.S., the Fed funds rate. But you have to be careful because you have, and here's where the where the degree of uh, difficulty comes into play. Because how to distinguish between a temporary and a permanent shock to the economy, mm. and when to act and when not to act. Right. So maybe you have a temporary shock. Boom. Uh, the case of Mexico, the exchange rate goes up suddenly, it devaluates, depreciates. Right. It goes from, you know, right now it's around 19, and it suddenly goes to 22 pesos per dollar. Okay. But initially, intuitive would be like, okay, let's let's intervene. Let's go into the foreign exchange market and start selling dollars, right, to lower the exchange rate. Right. But maybe you shouldn't do that because maybe that's a temporary shock. Or maybe something else happens that inflation goes up. And you're like, let's intervene. No, but wait, maybe you shouldn't intervene to wait and see what happens with the economy. Now, a example that happens currently with the U.S. economy. After the tax uh, uh, cut and jobs act from the U.S., we knew the U.S. economy was going to grow at 3% level. And it did last year, right? Right. But we also knew that the economy was going to slow it down. Mm-hmm. Right? And it is slowing down right mm-hmm. now, Right. But then the Fed and here in the U.S., you know, suddenly raised rates. Right. Because they thought last December, right, they thought that that push was going to create even more inflation pressures. And the day to day to day didn't happen. It didn't materialize, right? Right. Like, remember, remember December, we're talking about raising the rate about two times this year. Mm-hmm. Now we actually lowered the rate. Right. Who was going to forecast that last year? Mm. So that's, those are the things that, you know, the, you, you kind of learn that sometimes they're ca- counterintuitive to what you would think you should do when facing those types of dilemmas. Right. Kind of. Now, how does that play in with, like, the stock market had a really bad month last December. Yes. Uh, and, and how does that tie in with what the Fed was talking about? I mean, do, do those two things have anything to do with so, each other? Or is there a coincidence? So... There, the, so there's no, there's no coincidence. The thing is, you know, you have to be careful as, 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 a, as a central banker because you can't allow the, the, especially the stock market to determine your, your decisions. Right. You, know? you care about financial stability, right? You care that the financial part be, be the financial stability of the economy, right? Right. But you have to be careful that separate financial markets up, up and downs the daily up and downs right. Right, of the stock market with the actual current trends in the economy, the actual uh, ups and downs of what's happening with the economy. Right. right? So sometimes they're, they're aligned. The stock market is aligned with the economy, the expectations, right. but sometimes they're not, right? Mm-hmm. So you have to be really careful in distinguishing the difference between them. And also you can't be perceived, perceived as, mo- as, as reacting to what happens to the stock market. Right. That would be you know, really bad for a central bank. Hmm. So imagine the stock market goes down, up, and you're not trying to you're not trying to for the stock market to earn X amount of points, right? You're, that's not that's not your objective. You know, your objectives are especially for the U.S. are two objectives: full employment and price stability. Mm-hmm. It doesn't say Dow Jones of uh, five twenty thirty thousand points, right? right? Or stability in the, in the stock market. It, it you have a, you have the financial stability part of it, but that. Relates to other things also, right? Right. Now, answering to the whims of the financial markets and then answering to the whims of politicians, right? 
Right. You have to take your decisions based on facts, based on numbers, based on what's happening with the real economy. Right. right. What are the things from a lay person's perspective, what are the things that you pay the most attention to? You talked about price stability and you talked about full employment. What are the th- the other sub factors of those things that you pay the most attention to in determining what actions you're going to take as a central bank? Does that question make sense? Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, so besides that, also productivity. Yeah. What's happened with uh, with uh, productivity? That's a major determinant of what's going to happen to growth. Yeah. Right. Uh, in the case of depends on on the, on the on the country. The exchange rate would be important. In the case of Mexico, what's happening with the exchange rate? Mm-hmm. That would be really important. Because this is a smaller economy compared to our compared to the US economy. It's a humongous economy. Exchange rate fluctuations do play a role, but in a small economy like Mexico, they play a bigger role. So also, you know, those besides jobs, uh, inflation, uh, productivity. And also activity, manufacturing, what's happening with the manufacturing, wages also are playing oh, an important yeah, role. Yeah. What's happening? Wages. Uh, one of the characteristics of this expansion that actually reached, uh, we, we broke the record, right, right. in July, yeah. has been that of slow productivity, low wage growth, and low inflation, right? So also, I think, it, uh, also would be important to us in a central bank to look at uh, what's happening with with. Uh, with wages and also the, the financial sector, banking system. What's happening with credit? Uh, are people getting loans, uh, or, or what type of loans are they getting? Uh, the debt, the debt level, the leveraging also is really important to look at, look at. Mm-hmm. With regard to debt, at what point does debt or a deficit become worrisome? Uh, I. And it just thinking in terms of the United States. So um, right now we're in a sustainable path for the fiscal deficit. That's that's a thing we can, I think a lot of economists can agree upon. Uh, the issue here is that we're lucky. <laughs> we're the reserve currency of the world. Uh, we're, the, one of the, we're the largest economy in the world, or one of the largest. You know, China, we're competing with China. For that. Right. But we have all these things, institutions, the confidence, of the economy. So we've moved that, you know, that, that issue, you know, going forward, right? First, you would say a, a certain percentage of the, of the GDP was fine. And through time, we've, we've moved that level, right, to a higher level of, of, of debt. Mm-hmm. Now, yes, we have to fix that issue going forward. Any economy, like any family, you can't spend more than what you earn, right? Right. And here the issue is that, Yes, the government's spending a lot more than earns, especially from the entitlement programs. The entitlement programs are a big part of that, the non the non discretionary non discretionary spending. A lot part of that deficit. So you have to try to fix that. We're gonna have to, one day. We're gonna have to fix. You know, uh, one of the solutions proposed is you know increasing the the retirement age. Right. Mm-hmm. That would be a, a major issue of of of, of helping, uh, asking maybe people with low high, or a higher income to pay uh, to not receive social security or maybe pay more. Right, some some ideas of that, but there will be definitely there will be a day of reckoning when we have to fix our our balance our, our our fiscal balance 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 sheet here in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Okay, back to you. What made you decide to pursue a different career path to move away from uh, the central bank um, and go in a different so, direction? So basically I wanted to just, uh, I, I wanted to progress, mm-hmm. to, to, to progress my career, to, to become, you know, do something, something different things and, 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 and learn more things. You know, sometimes you, 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 the central, ba- central bank is a great place to work, but you get comfortable in that comfort zone. And you have to go out there and risk sometimes. You have to take that risk, that step. You know, a lot of people, you know, especially my family were like, or other, are you leaving? Really? You're leaving the central bank? You have this really cool job. Yeah, it's a great job. It's yeah, like, sure. You know, it's so secure. You do cool things. You know, uh, uh, the G20 meetings when I was there right. happened in Mexico. Yeah. So, oh. I, so I had an opportunity to meet Tim Geithner, Renanke. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, uh, Lagarde, that now is like going to be dominated for the European Central Bank. So you have all these cool things, you know. But I think it was time for me, if they want, I wanted to do something else and also, you know, become a better economist and leave that comfort zone. And, 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 and had this opportunity and had to take advantage of it, you know. 
if I wanted to grow mm -hmm. as, a, as an economist, and, and you know, so that's one way the reason I, I left. Jumping back to economics, we are taught in economics class that market economies basically work efficiently as long as there are not information problems, externalities, market power. Um, however, sometimes economies don't all work the same. For example, we often talk about Switzerland or the Nordic countries as having an interesting economic model, but one that might not work on the scale of a country like the United States. National economies often have their own unique personalities, so to speak. The question is, going back to before we move away from the central bank, what do you think is the most interesting feature of specifically Mexico's economy? So I think it's 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 the mix between the informal and formal economy. You have still a strong informal economy, and you have also a formal economy. When basically, I think Mexico is it's 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 a country that it's divided by those two things. You know, they've they've done such a great job, especially in the macro part, uh, uh, a part of it. They've done their homework. Mm -hmm. They've you know low fiscal deficit compared to the U.S. Very nothing, zero, one, minus 1% 1 of GDP, hmm. uh, 0.1 or 1%. 1%. Uh, they're also, you know, the central bank. The central bank's an autonomous institution. They actually put it in the constitution, in the Mexican constitution. So to eliminate their autonomy, they would have to actually make a humongous, ref they had to reform the constitution in Mexico to eliminate the autonomy. Okay. Also, you have the flexible change rate. Uh, also, the pursuit of trade policies. You know, compared to the rest of the world, Mexico still con believes in globalization and in trade. So that that's interesting. But the in the other part that you say, you have all these interesting dynamics at that at that at that time. But also you have the negative part of it. That's you know the the the, the informal economy, right? All those people right. that are not counted and, and do uh, don't pay taxes. Hmm. The lack of uh, rule of law. So those are the things that are are holding back the potential of, of the Mexican economy. If Mexico one day could fix those things, especially establishing the rule of law, uh, make uh, strengthening institutions in the economy, that would, you know, you know, allow Mexico to achieve higher growth rates. It would increase productivity in the country, right? Because yeah, you're formal as you count it. I wonder, uh, I, it, it would make you more productive, right? Right. Let's move to now. You study the Texas economy and real estate market and have developed regional indicators that measure economic activity in real estate and forecasting housing and commercial markets. Can you elaborate on these and explain how you interpret all of this and find it useful? So the idea behind this is we, we, what we try to do here at the center is create indicators that allow us to measure and analyze what's currently happening with the real estate market in the state of Texas and also what's happening with the Texas economy. Mm -hmm. So we develop all these cool indicators basically to tell you the business cycle. If Are you expanding? Are you contracting? So all, all of these indicators are for residential, single family housing, apartments, Office, commercial, commercial office, retail, and warehousing. So, with the idea of understanding what's happening and what's in the outlook for the future, and based on these indicators, we can now forecast what's going to happen with a certain degree of certainty. Mm -hmm. Right. Although, as we know, forecasting is a, is not a perfect uh, science. You know, it's funny. Uh, we economists. Basically, we do a really good job understanding what's happening, and we can explain what's happening uh, to people and, and, and see what the effects of those policies are going to be. Uh, but we, are, unfortunately, do a really good, bad job of forecasting, you know, honestly. And, may, and that's the truth because, you know, there's a lot of play, uh, factors in play. But given, even given that, with these indicators, we, we do with a level, certain level of certain, certainty and accuracy of what is going to happen going forward. Yeah. Uh, in, in economics, as in business forecasting, it's just oh yeah, exactly it's such a bear. Well, well, going back to what we were talking about earlier, you know, uh, everybody was expecting, you know, the Fed, even the Fed, was expecting, you know, during 2019 to raise rates. What happened was, <laughs> two weeks ago? A week ago, they actually lowered the rate. Right. right. So everything cha can change, right? What is your number one tip for someone who is looking to buy? 
property, house, land, uh, commercial property, anything. What would you What would you well, say it, people overlook it, most it, often? It, it goes up, uh, again up to the idea of location. You know, every situation is different. You know, right. uh, some markets are doing better than others, but uh, or let's say in a region that's doing so really really bad, there are going to be pockets where it's doing well. So you always have to look at at the situation of what's happening in that specific environment. Uh, and what's happened to your company, to you as a as a as a, uh, a head of a household, a part of a household? Do you want to buy a house? Well, it depends on the on your cycle. Uh, are you going to be sure of your job? Now, in the overall context right now, interest rates are really low, right? Mm-hmm. Interest rates are really low, and that's one thing. Uh, they're historically low going forward. Now. The, the housing market right now, currently in Texas, is slowing down. And one of the things that are, that are after years of really strong growth, going back more to, uh, to the normal, right, to the, media, to the mean growth rate that, we, that, that, they've, that it's been registered past in Texas. Right. So that comes with lower price growth rate. Now, that thing said, well, you still have to have the, the uh, if you're first time home buyer, or you want to buy a new house? Well, you has to, you have to have the money, right, to actually have put the down payment. Mm-hmm. Now that depends on your uh, how much money you have, your right. job, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. But right now the conditions are, if you think about it this way, of of a low interest rate environment. That's a pro for you if you want to lock in these low interest rates in going forward for a thirty year mortgage rate. Right. Okay. We would be remiss not to mention the Real Estate Center's podcast, The Red Zone, um, over 400 episodes and counting. Can you, I know your involvement with that is kind of peripheral. Can you tell us a little bit about what they do over there? So let me just say uh, the communications department of the Real Estate Center has done an awesome job through the years. The Red Zone podcast uh, was an idea from uh, Brian Pope, uh, uh, editor of, of, of of the Real Estate Center. He did a great job. He had this idea, a, a better way, a pathway mm-hmm. to communicate and relate uh, this information to uh, to the public in general. Uh, what's happening in, in the tax economy? What's happening in the real estate markets, housing, and commercial? Mm-hmm. So he had this this uh, great idea, and he established it. Now we have a great new hire, Haley uh, Haley uh, Ryder, who is a communication specialist, and she's moved forward. You know, she's 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 improved it. Uh, a great deal. So I think it's 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 a great way for the real estate center to communicate to the public what's happening in in the real estate market, especially here in Texas. Mm-hmm. In your mind, what is the best thing the red zone provides for the real estate center? What is the best function that it fulfills? So I think one of the uh, great function it does. In my case, I uh, was recently interviewed uh, about one of my articles. Mm-hmm. Besides, you, we talked about what we produce. We know those those reports we produce about the Texas economy, the commercial commercial uh, real estate market, uh, housing apartments. Uh, we also focus on uh, specific research articles for our Terra Grande ma- magazine, uh, and it's a good th- it, the the Red Zone podcast. It's a good way for us as researchers. To, sh- to communicate our fi- fi- findings to the public, I see. our research, you know, uh, it's a pathway to communicate that. So in my case, I was interviewed recently about one of our cool articles we did, something different than real estate. We did something about uh, technological change, automation, the impact of what was going to happen to the Texas economy. Mm-hmm. The research, research has been done for the U.S. economy, world economy, but what we did is we, we focused on only on Texas. And, and and the Redstone podcast, it was a opportunity for them to ask us, you know, what's going to happen? What did you find? How do you see automation affecting jobs in in Texas? What's the future outlook for for Texas jobs based on technological change? So it, so that's my case, but also for the other researchers, it's a great a great way for them to come and talk about what the research doing. Uh, that we've done something about Harvey also at that moment, when, uh, going back to uh, with the effects of Harvey. So it, we've done various topics, you know, and, and, and it's a good way to, to talk about our ongoing research and to communicate to the, to the public about that. Let's move, to some, let's move to some rapid fire. What do you consider your most valuable failure? Being afraid and been, be afraid of uh, the social stigma of pressure from high school. 
Okay. I think I was a, a failure in my time. And I, I grew up, I'm mature now. But at that moment, you know, you're in high school, you want to be cool. Right. You want to be right. part of the group. And sometimes, you know, you, you, you kind of follow the norm. Maybe there's somebody saying bad, bullying somebody or uh-huh. not. And you're instead of being, you know, stop it. It's not, it's not cool. You don't, you don't right. have to do that. I think that's one of my failures of, 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 of the, 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 being afraid. I think about my, my grandfather was more serious. He knew when he talk, like he knew like, but especially you see older people yeah. they suddenly say something and you're like, and they're really frank. They're really straight and sincere because they're not, they're not afraid. You know, this is the way I've seen things. This is the way things have worked for me. I've looked there, it works. And this is my opinion. Mm-hmm. And they're not like, oh, oh, Ben is going to say something bad about me. Or Lisa's not going <laughs> to like what I said. Oh, you see, True. It, because they're, they're secure. You know, and like you said, once you start to go older and more mature, you become a little bit more, I think, more confident you know, in, in your beliefs. And, you, and especially in, in what you have to stand up to things and not be afraid, right? Right. You seem like a very friendly and forthcoming guy. What do you think is people's biggest misconception of you? So I think uh, one misconception that I think it is sometimes uh, is the idea that, you know, we're a nice guy, nice person. They, they think you're weak. Oh, I, I, I don't yeah. like that because you're still, still, still strong. It doesn't mean because, you know, you're, you're nice. It means you're weak or you're going to be a pushover if you're a boss or something like that. Right. I don't believe in tyranny when you're a boss. You know, I'm mm. going to be like, yeah, oh, my God, I'm going to scream and be like, yeah, the worst boss. It doesn't work. You know, fear doesn't work. Yeah, you don't throw it. chairs like Kyle does? Uh, I, will, I will throw chairs. You know, uh, I heard stories about other people that other works where people, the boss is like, ah, screams and yells and follows the employee through the hall, screaming. And don't, don't do that. You don't have to do that. I think sugar plays a really cool. You have to be strong when you have to be strong. You know, you can't. But it doesn't mean you're going to be, you know, it doesn't mean you're weak or anything. Mm-hmm. It's time to be strong. Oh, you put the law and you, you follow the rules, right? Right. But th- that, I, that's the only thing, you know, people think because when people are nice, they think, oh, it's a weakness. Now I can't, you know, it's going to be a pushover. But no, no, it doesn't mean that. You could be a nice guy, but you still could be strong, right? Right. It's, it's such a challenge in authority. The other thing, and then the other side of that same coin is that when you are in a position of authority, your disapproval means more than it does among peers. And so you have to be careful. I've heard the phrase, like, how much of the sword do you show? I don't know if that phrase makes yeah, sense, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's, it's such a challenge to walk that line well, to make it clear that you are willing to do what it takes. Exactly. Yes, I agree with that. Essentially, whatever it takes, well, you know, within the within the boundaries of reasonable behavior and the law, of course. Of course. Um, but uh, the idea that respect is paramount, and yet, nevertheless, love is also paramount, and um, and respect goes both ways. Mm-hmm. It's it's so challenging to to strike that balance well. Um, People really have to believe that you want what's best for them, but the respect has to be there too. I don't know what I'm saying here. No, no, but, you're, uh, you're the right time. I agree with you. you know, and you do want it. You know, it's, 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 it's interesting. I don't know why, you know, humans are complicated sometimes, but you know, it's, it's interesting. Like, especially when you're a teacher, you want to teach, you want the best for your students, you know, especially, you know, at the, at the level of the MBA. In my case, when I came here and started teaching, I had the idea, you know, Different, you know, I, I'm here to, for you to learn. I, I want you to learn. I want you to interact with me. I want, to, I want you to talk to me. Right. I want you to talk, to talk cool stuff, you know, interesting things about this is what I think about the economy. This is about business. No, Louise, you're wrong because of this. Right. That's the things I want, that interaction, that, that, that respect. But people sometimes, you know, for, 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 like you said, that forget that and think about, oh, it's the grade. It's just about the grade yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Or, or the job. Sure. Uh, this guy's, is, well, I'm the boss and he's just, you know, evaluating me. You know, it's not about that. It's, it's more than that. You know, it's, I want you also to, to succeed and right. having that, that relationship when we both, you know, uh, push us to be better, right? Yeah. And make us better. That, that's what I want, right? Yeah. That makes sense. If you could have anyone as a mentor for one day, who would it be? Ooh, that's, a, that's a really tough question. You made me think about it because, you know, as, uh, I would definitely I would have to, as, as an economist, you have so many... T- you know, one person that, that I thought about was like a, a Paul Walker, former chairman of the Federal Reserve. Uh, he doesn't get a lot of credit. People don't know him, you know, 
but he was the actual one who started uh, uh, price stability, mm -hmm. lowering inflation in the U.S. Before that, you know, 70s, the U.S. economy, we had inflation level, two digits inflation levels. Right. He came in as chairman. He was pressured, you know. He entered, he had to stop inflation. But the cost was basically a recession, you know. Imagine the pressure for the president. You, Okay, I'm lowering inflation, but I'm causing a recession. And the president's going to be like, you're not going to, thanks to you, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to win the election, right? Right. So he did an awesome job. You know, he, he, he started a worldwide change paradigm. He changed the paradigm. He started, and I think the rest of the world follows the idea, the importance of price stability. Yeah. Now we take it as a granite, as a granite, right? No, nobody's going to think here right now, Ben, you know, ask anybody below maybe 25 about what are your inflation expectations for the coming years? They're probably going to say, what, maybe 2%? Right, and they never think about inflation at a, at a two-digit level, more than ten percent a year, right? And it's happening around the world. You know, he started a a a, a, he, a, a big change in the world that central bankers uh, worked around the world. Importance of price stability, and you know that happened in, in the U.S. It moved to the rest of the world. It even happened in Mexico. You now they have now Mexico is as a fortunately doesn't have an issue with, with price stability. Uh, Greenspan came in. He, I think he gave more, get more, got more of the glory. Right. Right. Then uh, Bernanke came in. Who did a well? Of course, he had to face the the financial crisis. That was one of the biggest challenges uh, that any any uh, central banker could face besides the Great Depression. That was incredible. Then Janet Yellen uh, and uh, Mr. Powell. But all of them, I think, has have come since since him. I think all that idea, that price stability, the anchoring of inflation expectations. Has come from Paul Bork, Bolker, so he he was the difference that we mm -hmm. see now. Yeah, very nice. Most important piece of business or career advice that our listeners might not have heard before. So I think, and this was I, I, one of the things I learned at Central Bank. This uh, one of my bosses that taught me this, and it was really cool. I really just, and especially you know, all of us we like to complicate things. You know, oh my God, what's happening with the economy? What's happening with the market? And you start to make all these ideas and look at things and the, all of this idea. And about my boss was really simple. Please, 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 take it easy. You don't have to look at all these theories, all these things. Put it in simple terms of supply and demand. Hmm. If you simply understand supply and demand, what's going to cause demand to shift? What's going to cause the quantity of demand to change? Supply then you can understand how any market, any economy is working. Hmm. And I was like, yeah, you're right. And, he, and it was awesome. He was, well, he was more experienced, really smart person. In a minute, we, there was, we were talking about maybe the financial crisis, and he, boom, like he simplified it, everything with supply and demand. Mm -hmm. Supply, this is demand, this is what's happening, boom, that's where we are. You're like, oh. So I would suggest anybody, you know, put in... Don't make it too complicated. Just put it, try to put it in terms, when you're trying to understand a market, an economy, what's happening, put it in simple terms of supply and demand. And what are the factors that move that demand? What are the factors that move that supply? And we'll show you what's going to happen with the price. Well, and then when you're thinking, of, especially on the supply side, what supply really comes down to is opportunity costs, right? Yeah, that's part of it. Yes, the opportunity cost of doing, and, uh, of, of anything, right? The opportunity cost and, and the cost of the firm and what's what makes the firm, exactly, the opportunity cost of producing more or less. Right. The incentives that, that com the, the, the company has to, to supply, supply more or less in the economy or in the market. Right, right. What is your fondest memory of Texas a and I think I, I really, going back to what I was talking about earlier, the first time I came in here, yeah. I flew into Mexico, I think... I like the warmth of the of, of, of the Aggies. It was a really great place. It made me it made me feel feel at home. When I came here, I felt the warmth. I said, "You know what?" I, I called my wife and my family. I told my kids, yeah. "We're going to move here to College Station. This is a great opportunity." I really enjoyed the job uh, the job interview. Everybody, and that's one of the things I really liked here: the environment, the positive environment, especially at the, at the real estate center and, and and the campus and everybody here. I really like that that, 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 that Aggie warmth, and, and, and it's really cool. And, and, and you know what? It's interesting, you know, after that, after a year after that, I came in here, we had a wedding in Ixtapa, in Suatanejo, Mexico, in the beach. Yeah. So, so I was there with my, with, 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 uh, with my friends on the beach and my wife, and then I see a, a, a person coming from the beach, from, from, from bathing in the beach, coming out of the beach, you know? 
And you're laughing. He had an Aggie cap. <laughs> what's, what's the coincidence of that? That's I'm like, great. wow. And I, I had to come up to him. Right. I had to do, whoop, hey, you're yeah. an Aggie. What's up, class? He was, he was from Puebla, Mexico. Yeah. He was an Aggie. He came yeah. here. He did a degree. He was an architect. Yeah. And, and then after that, he went back to Mexico. He has his company mm-hmm. in Mexico development. He actually was selling a hotel yeah. development in Ixtapa. And it was lucky. He was like, oh, yeah, I got you your love. I he told me he would fly to the game sometimes mm-hmm. from Puebla to see the, to the Aggies play. So I was like, wow. So th- th- that's the always what I like about it here, about Texas A&M, the Aggies. There's the warmth of, of, of every Aggie. Beautiful. So it's a great place. Love that. Do you have anyone you would like to send Good Bull? I would say to David Jones, our editor. The, uh-huh. uh, uh, he's senior editor. He's the ultimate Aggie. He came to hear the school. He was part of the core. After that, he came back. He knows all the Aggie stories. He has a, he's a season football uh, uh, ticket holder for I don't know how many years. Right. <laughs> he's still here. He has great stories. He's the ultimate Aggie. When I think of an Aggie, I always think about David, David Jones. And he's he also, besides that, he's a great person, uh, great man, great family. He just earned the distinguished uh, distinguished uh, employee because of his service here for a and for X amount of years. Mm-hmm. So he, he, great person. Great, great, great colleague. Wonderful, and wonderful. Great friend also. Luis, thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure speaking with you and hearing your story. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for watching. If you would like to stay up to date on our latest videos, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon to receive notifications. If you're in a rush or on the road, you can still join us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. If you want to learn more about us or our guests, please visit our website at maze.tamu.edu slash podcasts. Also, please check out Mays Business School's academic programs. They're the sponsors of our show, and you can find them in the description. Thanks, and gig'em.